All right, everybody, welcome back. In this episode, we're going to take uh, 2 Kings chapter 3, and we're going to speak about the miracles of Elisha. So let's review. Elisha was farming when Elijah came to him, and he was working a rich man's fields, plowing with the twelfth of twelve pair of oxen. So Elijah threw his coat around Elisha, and that claimed him for his service, and he walked on. And Elisha was ready to follow, but he begged permission to say goodbye to his parents. Later, Elisha killed the oxen he was working with, and he cooked them by burning his farm equipment, literally burning his bridges behind him. So Elisha became Elijah's attendant and later his successor. So during the years of Elisha, Israel was constantly threatened by a powerful Syria, led first by Ben-Hadad and later by Hazel. Ahab was dead, but members of his family still ruled. And like their father, they followed wicked ways. So Elisha lived to command the anointing of Jehu as king of Israel. Jehu destroyed not only Ahab's family, but also wiped out Baal worship in Israel. The stories of Elisha give us insight into this critical point of the Old Testament history and help us see God as one who remains involved in the lives of ordinary people, even when the nation has strayed far from his ways. And we're going to talk about the Moabite stone here, uh, the war against Moab. The Moabite stone also called the Meshestel, was discovered in 1868, and it contains a Moabite inscription that confirms many of the events of 2 Kings chapter 3, but it gives it a distinctly pro-Moabite spin. Let's just jump into the first three verses, a summary of Jehoram's reign, the son of Ahab. Now, Jehoram, the son of Ahab, became king over Israel at Samaria in the 18th year of Jehoshaphat, king of Judah and reigned twelve years. And he did evil in the sight of the Lord, but not like his father and mother. For he put away the sacred pillar of Baal that his father had made. Nevertheless, he persisted in the sins of Jeroboam, the son of Nebat, who made Israel sin, and he did not depart from them. So Jehoram came from a family that was far beyond dysfunctional. His father Ahab was one of the worst kings the northern kingdom of Israel ever knew, and his mother Jezebel was certainly the worst queen Israel ever knew. So Jehoram was better than his father and mother, but he was still a wicked man. He was the ninth consecutive bad king over the northern kingdom, which never had a godly king. And the sins of Jeroboam that Jeroboam or, or Jehoram perpetuated were not related to the worship of Baal, but to the false worship of God under the calf or ox images that Jeroboam set up in Dan and Bethel. This was primarily a political strategy rather than a religious one. And he appears to have been, in spiritual matters, one of the most undecided neutral characters who puzzle most observers, and who never seem to know themselves just where they stand or belong. He put, he put away the Baal statue made by his father Ahab, but he never really became a real believer in Jehovah. So Paul believed that Jehoram put away Baal worship out of bad motives, either because he was frightened when he remembered the judgment that came against his father Ahab and his brother Ahaziah, or because he wanted to impress Jehoshaphat so the Judean king would agree to an alliance. Elisha wasn't impressed with Jehoram's putting away of Baal, and we'll get to that in verse 13. So Jehoram was the second son of Ahab and Jezebel, and successor of his brother Ahaziah, who died without having any children. In the 18th year after Jehoshaphat began reigning as sole king of Judah, the southern kingdom, uh, Jehoram became king over Israel, the northern kingdom, and he reigned 12 years, from 852 to 841 BC. And though Jehoram did get rid of that idol, he remained sympathetic to and supportive of Baal worship in Israel. And though he was wicked, he was less evil than his father Ahab and his mother Jezebel, but he did cleave to the sins of Jeroboam, which was calf worship. So the great ministry of Elisha, already begun and revealed in part, is now recorded in this large section of stories from chapter 3, verse 4, all the way to chapter 8, verse 15. All right, verses 4 and 5, Moab's Rebellion. Now, Mesha, king of Moab, was a sheep breeder, and he regularly paid the king of Israel, the northern kingdom, 100,000 lambs and the wool of 100,000 rams. But it happened when Ahab died that the king of Moab rebelled against the king of Israel. So the Moabites lived on the eastern side of the Dead Sea and were under tribute to Israel. When King Ahab died, the king of the Moabites saw an opportunity to escape the taxation that the king of Israel forced upon them. 
So the Moabites raised sheep, and when Omri subjugated Moab, he imposed a tribute of lambs and wool, which the Moabites grudgingly provided for years. And when Ahab died in battle, Mesha the Moabite king rebelled against King Ahaziah in chapter 1 verse 1. And Mesha considered Israel weakened enough after Ahab's death for Moab to attempt to gain her freedom. And you can see Second Chronicles chapter 20 for a previous Moabite invasion of Judah when the Moabites were destroyed and Moab was left too weak to repel the alliance. This rebellion seems to have been ineffective since Mesha also rebelled against Ahaziah's successor, Jehoram, chapter 3, verses 4 through 27. Jehoram, therefore, gathered his troops together and made an alliance with Jehoshaphat to join forces with him to bring Moab back into subjection. All right, verses 6 through 8, Israel and Judah joined together to fight Moab. So King Jehoram went out of Samaria at that time and mustered all Israel. Then he went out and sent to Jehoshaphat, king of Judah, saying, The king of Moab has rebelled against me. Will you go with me to fight against Moab? And he said, I will go up. I am as you are, my people as your people, my horses as your horses. Then he said, Which way shall we go up? And he answered, By the wilderness of Edom. All right, so Jehoshaphat was a godly king in 1 Kings chapter 22, verses 41 through 43. And he followed in the godly footsteps of his father Asa, 1 Kings chapter 15, verses 9 through 15. Yet Asa fought against Israel in 1 Kings chapter 15. 15, verse 16, while Jehoshaphat made peace with the northern kingdom in 1 Kings chapter 22, verse 44. So, though greater Israel was long since separated by a civil war, the two nations, Judah and Israel, right, southern and northern kingdoms, were now willing to come together to fight this common foe. And Jehoram of Israel asked Jehoshaphat of Judah for military advice because Jehoshaphat was more experienced in the battle than Jehoram. The king of Judah advised Jehoram that they attack Moab from the south, going through the very desert of the Edomites. So the fact that Jehoram sought an alliance with Jehoshaphat will indicate that he needed to cross the Judean territory in order to advance against Moab. This in turn indicates that Mesha had strengthened his northern border. If Jehoram could gain Jehoshaphat, then he would also gain Edom, which was now under Judah. And Jehoshaphat forgot the alliances with those who sin against the Lord are forbidden to believers. And Jehoram suggested attacking from the south through the desert of Edom rather than from the north, and the more normal, though heavily defended, frontier. The route chosen by Jehoshaphat passed along the west side of the Dead Sea and around its southern end. All right, verses 9 and 10, the armies of Israel, Judah, and Edom are stranded in the desert without water. So the king of Israel went with the king of Judah and the king of Edom, and they marched on that roundabout route seven days. And there was no water for the army nor for the animals that followed them. And the king of Israel said, Alas, for the Lord has called these three kings together to deliver them into the hand of Moab. So these combined armies of Judah, Israel, and Edom had to travel a considerable distance to attack Moab from the south. Verse 9 mentions the king of Edom, but we've already been told in 1 Kings 22, verse 47, that there was no king in Edom at this time. So king here must refer to a vice-regent appointed by the king of Judah. And Jehoram's guilty conscience convinced him that this calamity was a judgment of God. His own sin made him think that everything happened against him was a judgment of God. Right? And when they were unable to find water for the troops, their campaign not only was halted, but they were in danger of being conquered by the Moabites. Edom at this time was under Judah's authority and joined the alliance. After marching through Judah down the southwestern coast of the Dead Sea, around the northern, or excuse me, the southern end, and into Edom, the army ran out of water. All right, verses 11 and 12, the godly Jehoshaphat seeks God's word in the matter. But Jehoshaphat said, Is there no prophet of the Lord here that we may inquire of the Lord by him? So one of the servants of the king of Israel answered and said, Elisha, the son of Shaphat, is here, who poured water on the hands of Elijah. And Jehoshaphat said, The word of the Lord is with him. So the king of Israel and Jehoshaphat and the king of Edom went down to him. So both Jehoram and Jehoshaphat believed that there was a spiritual divine element to their current crisis. Jehoram believed that God was to be avoided because of the crisis, while Jehoshaphat believed that God should be sought because of the crisis. And this is a wonderful title for any servant of God. Elisha was the humble and practical servant of Elijah, and this was spiritual service that prepared him for further spiritual service. And we get a encouraging humility on the part of the three kings. Normally, kings demand that others come see them, but now these three were willing to go see uh, the prophet. 
As on an earlier occasion in 1 Kings chapter 22, verse 7, Jehoshaphat suggested that they find a prophet of the Lord who could obtain instructions for them. One of Jehoram's officers volunteered that Elisha was nearby. Probably the Lord had directed him there to be ready for this mission, and it is unlikely that he was traveling with the army. Pouring water on the hands of another for washing was a servant's work. Elisha had been Elijah's minister in 1 Kings chapter 19, verse 21. And evidently the officer thought that Jehoram did not know Elisha, which might have been the case. Whether Jehoram knew of Elisha or not, Jehoshaphat did. So humbling themselves before the prophet, the three kings paid him a visit. And King Jehoshaphat, being a God-fearing man, suggested that they call a prophet of God to give them direction. And we could wish he had asked for God's guidance before he formed this alliance with Israel's godless king. And Elisha's response is interesting and is going to reveal his contempt for Jehoram. All right, verses 13 through 15, Elisha agrees to speak with the three kings. Then Elisha said to the king of Israel, right, the northern kingdom, What have I to do with you? Go to the prophets of your father and the prophets of your mother. But the king of Israel said to him, No, for the Lord has called these three thing, uh, kings together to deliver them into the hand of Moab. And Elisha said, As the Lord of hosts lives, before whom I stand, surely were it not that I regard the presence of Jehoshaphat, king of Judah, I would not look at you nor see you. But now bring me a musician. Then it happened when the musician played that the hand of the Lord came upon him. So Elisha his call was to continue the ministry of Elijah, and here he imitated Elijah's plain speaking to powerful people. Elisha's plain speaking struck the conscience of the king of Israel. And this is, uh, what have I to do with you? This, this is a Hebrew idiom. It's commonly employed to express emphatic denial in 2 Samuel chapter 16, verse 10, or differences of opinion between persons involved in John chapter 2, verse 4. And it wasn't that Elisha was against every king or powerful person. He was willing to speak to these three kings for the sake of Jehoshaphat, the godly king of Judah. And when Elisha wanted to become more sensitive to the leading and speaking of the Holy Spirit, he asked for a service of a musician. This demonstrates the great spiritual power in music. And this he requires that his mind, which had been disturbed and inflamed with holy anger at the sight of wicked Jehoram, might be composed and cheered and united within itself, and that he might be excited to a more fervent prayer to God and joyfully praising him, whereby he was prepared to receive the prophetical announcement. And the way to be filled with the Spirit is to edify yourselves by psalms, hymns, and spiritual songs. And this nameless musician was endowed with a God-given talent, and he used him for the good of others. Surely it never occurred to him by his music that he would help win a military victory and have a dramatic effect on history. But when he shared his God-given ability, the power of God came upon the prophet. <laughs> so Elisha's question is probably an idiom meaning, right? Why should I obey you, right? Looking back here. The prophet's suggestion that J Jehoram go to his parents' prophets implies that since the king promoted Baal worship that he should seek his own god. And this barb forced Jehoram to face up to the impotency of Baal. Jehoram's uh, rejoinder placed the blame for the army's predicament on the Lord. And he had become he had come to Elisha because now it was up to Yahweh to get them out of their trouble. And Elisha was not intimidated by Jehoram's charge. He knew that God had not directed Israel into its difficulty, but that the army was there on the king's initiative. Nevertheless, for Jehoshaphat's sake, Elisha consented to seek a word from the Lord. His words, as surely as the Lord Almighty lives, whom I serve, are strikingly similar to Elijah's words to Jehoram's father Ahab in 1 Kings chapter 17, verse 1, and 2 Kings chapter 5, verse 16. Elisha received a direct revelation and proceeded to explain God's plan. The campaign against Moab uh, demonstrates how utterly abominable heathen religion was to God, right? The outcome was the object lesson to Israel showing her why she should turn from idolatry. Nevertheless, she did not turn from it. So water and victory. Then God promises that there is going to be victory and they're going to be given water and they will completely subjugate Moab. And you're going to notice the remarkable way that God accomplishes this. And heart music helped put Elisha into a frame of mind in which he could readily discern the Lord's direction. And you'll note David's harp playing also helped soothe Saul in 1 Samuel chapter 16, verse 23. All right, verse 16 through 19, the word from God. And he said, Thus says the Lord, 
make this valley full of ditches. For thus says the Lord, you shall not see wind, nor shall you see rain. Yet that valley shall be filled with water, so that you, your cattle, and your animals may drink. And this is a simple matter in the sight of the Lord. And he will also deliver the Moabites into your hand. Also you shall attack every fortified city and every choice city, and shall cut down every good tree, and stop up every spring of water, and ruin every good piece of land with stones. So this was a strange promise from God. Water would be provided, but without any apparent rain or storm. And God promised to send water to the valley, but they had to dig ditches to catch what God would provide. They had to dig the ditches before water was apparent, so they could benefit from it when it came. The dried up riverbed was to have many trenches, right? Hebrew uh, trenches, trenches dug to retain the flash flood. And when the kings returned from their visit to Elisha and told their commanders to have the men dig ditches, it must have been hard to hear. Right? These men were thirsty, near dead men in the middle of the desert, and they don't look forward to the hard work of digging ditches and dry ground. Yet this work was essential. And this demonstrates the principle that God wants us to prepare for the blessing he wants to bring. Listening to him, we are to anticipate his working and to get ready for it. Digging ditches was something the people of God could do. God didn't ask them to do more than what they were able to do. When God wants us to prepare for the blessing he's going to bring, he gives us things that we can really do. And if we expect to obtain the Holy Spirit's blessing, we must prepare for its reception. Make this valley full of trenches is an order which is given me this morning for the members of this church. Make ready for the Holy Ghost power. Be prepared to receive that which he is about to give. And each man in his place and each woman in her sphere. Make the whole of this church full of trenches for the reception of the divine water floods. Right? Right? Prepare to do God's work. He does not want you to stand idly by. But the most of people are going to say, well, you know, of course, if God sends a blessing, then we must then enlarge. Yes, that is the way of unbelief and the road to the curse. But the way of faith and the road to the blessing is this. God has promised it, and we will get ready for it. God is engaged to bless. Let, now let us be prepared to receive you know, that blessing. That reward, right? Act not on the mere strength of what you have, but in expectation of that which you have asked. So the kings came to Elisha inquiring about water. God wanted to give them more than their immediate need. God wanted to give them more than immediate provision, and he wanted to give them complete victory over their enemies. So cutting down all the good trees is going to make it difficult for the Moabites to have fruit to eat and would mean that they would have little shade. Stopping up all the springs would limit the Moabites' water supply and putting large stones in the fields would retard cultivation and lessen their productivity. All right, verse 20, God meets their need for provision when mysterious water flows through the camp. Now it happened in the morning when the grain offering was offered that suddenly water came by way of Edom and the land was filled with water. And it seems that God sent an intense downpour in the nearby mountains and this caused a flash flood through the desert of Edom. And the water was available only because they were obedient to dig the ditches. The ditches collected the water from the flash flood. If Israel and Judah had disobeyed God's word and failed to dig the ditches, then God's blessing would have passed them by. God told them to get ready and prepare to receive and catch his blessing. God often moves us to do things that may or may not make much sense for us at the moment, but they are things that are going to prepare us for what he will do in the future. The measure of water available to these thirsty men was directly connected to how faithful they were to dig the ditches. The more ditches and the bigger the ditches, the more water was provided. Though it was hard and unpleasant work, the more they did, the more blessing they received. And the ditches were not a blessing. They were not the victory, though they were the essential parts of both the blessing and the victory. When God wants us to do something to prepare for blessing, we should not confuse the preparation with the blessing itself. Without the miraculous blessing of God, the ditches meant nothing. So evidently God caused the water from rains in Edom to flow down into the valley and fill the trenches that had been dug. This water was an expression of God's love for his people. The fact that it didn't rain locally probably caused the Moabites to think that having water in the valley was impossible. The morning sacrifice included a lamb and a grain and drink offering. And you'll note Exodus chapter 29 verses 38 through 43. Right, Verse 21 through 25, the Moabites attacked the camp of the three kings. And when all the Moabites heard that the kings had come up to fight against them, 
All who were able to bear arms and older were gathered, and they stood at the border. And they rose up early in the morning, and the sun was shining on the water, and the Moabites saw the water on the other side as red as blood. And they said, This is blood. The kings have surely struck swords and have killed one another. Now therefore, Moab, go to, uh, to the spoil. So when they came up to the camp of Israel, Israel rose up and attacked the Moabites so that they fled before them and they entered their land, killing the Moabites. Then they destroyed the cities and each man threw a stone in every good piece of land and filled it. And they stopped up all the springs of water. They cut down all the good trees, but they left the stones of uh, Kir Haseth intact. However, the slingers surrounded and attacked it. So the ditches caught the water and saved the armies of these three kings from dehydration. They were also the means of confusion and defeat to the enemies of the people of God. When they saw the sun shining on the water collected in the ditches, they thought it was blood from the three kings fighting each other. And so God used the ditches in a completely unexpected way to supply the need and to defeat the enemy. And the whole account of God's provision in the desert gives many principles that apply to Christian leadership, right? Digging ditches, you know, leadership is hard work. Leadership is done with faith in the future. It's done um, like digging ditches. Leadership is blessed beyond reasonable expectation. It must use delegation. It matters nothing without a miracle, right? The work of leadership often feels like work without reward. It comes from God's revelation. It will be criticized and doubted. It means not accepting the present state of dryness, right? Like digging ditches, the work of leadership often seems unimpressive or unspectacular. And the work of leadership is purposely used and relied on by God, right? But surely the fruit trees are not intended here, for this was uh, positively against the law of God, right? They cut down all the good trees. And you'll note Deuteronomy chapter 20, verses 19 and 20 for that. All right. So not expecting water, these Moabites assumed that the water shining in the sunlight was blood. So this Moabite army erroneously concluded that the Israelites, uh, Judahites, and Edomites had some sort of falling out and slaughtered each other. Not an unrealistic possibility especially given the past, right? So thinking that the Confederate kings had come to blows and the troops had destroyed each other, the Moabites forgot about warfare and each man takes off to get a share of the spoil. This, of course, gives Israel a distinct advantage. So rather than advancing with weapons drawn for battle, they ran to plunder the dead soldiers' armor and weaponry. But instead, they ran into waiting ranks of their enemies. Defenseless, the Moabites fled before the Israelites. The Israelites, presumably their allies with them, invaded Moab. They slaughtered the people, destroyed many towns and did to the field springs and trees what God had instructed in 2 Kings chapter 3 verse 19. So such destruction represented the ordinary war policy of that time, now called a scorched earth policy. But Kir uh, Hariseth, the major city and King Mesh's refuge, couldn't be taken, and it was situated at the end of a valley and successfully resisted the attacks of stone slingers surrounding it. All right, verse 26 through 27, the king of Moab's desperate move. And when the king of Moab saw that the battle was too fierce for him, he took with him 700 men who drew swords to break through the king of Edom, but they could not. Then he took his eldest son, who would have reigned in his place, and offered him as a burnt offering upon the wall. And there was a great indignation against Israel, so they departed from him and returned to their own land. So this shows how desperate the king of Moab was following his defeat on the field of battle. He did this to honor his pagan gods and to show his own people his determination to prevent defeat. The radical determination of the king of Moab convinced the kings of Israel, Judah, and Edom that they could not completely defeat Moab. They left content with their near-complete victory. So sickened by the maddened spectacle, of, or maddened spectacle of senseless human sacrifice, the allies lifted the siege and returned to their homes. So courageously, he assembled 700 swordsmen, he broke out of the city, and he attacked the king of Edom, whom he apparently concluded was the uh, weakest link in the three-nation alliance. He wasn't successful, however, and was forced back behind the walls. So defeat in battle was regarded by pagan Near Eastern warriors as a sign that their gods were angry with them. To propitiate his god, Chemosh, in 1 Kings chapter 11, verse 7, and verse 33, and 2 Kings chapter 23, verse 13, Mesha offered his firstborn son, the heir to his own throne, as a human sacrifice on top of the city wall. It was not Israel's intent to annihilate the Moabites. They only wanted to keep their neighbors from rebelling against their sovereignty to keep them under their control. So offensive to the allies was Mesha's act of sacrificing his own son that they withdrew and returned home. Israel had won the battle even though they hadn't destroyed uh, Kir Hariseth or captured Mesha. 
So you're going to get the great indignation in Israel, right? Not against, as in the AV. The Hebrew preposition here indicates that Judah and Israel were indignant because of this abominable uh, or abominable act in Leviticus chapter 18, verse 21, and chapter 20, verse 3, right? If Israel was so deeply moved in this case, why was she not shocked enough to forsake her own idolatry, right? But idolatry continued in Israel and in Judah. So you get a remarkable archaeological discovery, the Moabite stone that we talked about earlier. It contains Mesh's own record of this battle and other battles with Israel. On this stone, the Moabite king claimed to have been delivered from the Israelites by his god Chemosh on this day. Though it is true that he was not captured at Kir Hareseth and the Israelites withdrew, Israel and her allies were the real victors in this campaign. The account of this battle provides further proof of the sovereignty of God and of the complete vanity of idols and idolatry. But even with so many proofs, Israel continued to spurn the Lord and foolishly worship pagan deities. And that ties up chapter 3. Next time we will continue Elisha's miracles in chapter 4. Thank you for joining me.